Good evening, everybody. Good, uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture. Uh, pardon my derby, all right? But we all want to be in, in the mood tonight about Al Smith. Pardon my unlit cigar. Uh, were the governor still in charge, that anti-smoking ban would be long gone, okay? And really, if you look closely, pardon my, uh, well, never mind, all right? <laughs> I never was for prohibition. Um, history, culture, ethnic and religious issues and diversity, politics, just a few of the um, abundant topics that this Sheen Center explores and does it very effectively. And tonight, tonight everybody, we consider a colorful and courageous man who personified all of those themes. Alfred Emanuel Smith, the happy warrior. Our uh, four-term governor, this is the 90th anniversary of Al's campaign as the Democratic nominee for president, the first Catholic ever, in 1928. As you well know, he lost, and lost considerably that election, and later said, it's probably good I did, or they would have blamed the Depression on the Catholics too, all right? <laughs> I welcome all of you this evening, especially the members of the Alfred E. Smith Foundation Board, which since the first dinner, uh, 1946, if I'm not mistaken, has the board has governed and distributed over $150 million to a cause very close to the Happy Warrior's heart, name, namely poor moms and their kids. We're very grateful this evening to have two eminent authors um, uh, on the life and the impact of Governor Alfred E. Smith. The first I would introduce is the governor's biographer, uh, Dr. Robert uh, Slayton. Dr. He, he wrote The Magnificent, which is still considered the definitive um, biography of Al Smith, Empire Statesman, by Dr. Robert Slayton. He's a professor of history in California, Chapman, and uh, he knows more about Al Smith than anybody. So, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Slayton, welcome, and thank you for being with us from uh, California. We also welcome our homegrown, Terry Galway, who's just released Frank and Al, FDR, Al Smith, and the unlikely alliance that created the Democratic Party, which is the talk of the town today. Each will speak about uh, 20 minutes, uh, then to be followed by uh, Dr. Uh, is Terry Galway here? Terry, come on out. Welcome. We're glad you're with us. Hallelujah. Dr. Slayton and Mr. Galway will speak about 20 minutes each, and then they'll be followed by uh, myself and a man whose family memories of the Happy Warrior will be, I promise you, colorful and enlightening our own Al Smith IV. Al, welcome. <laughs> Robert, do you need this? No. All right. Dr. Slayton, take it away. Your Eminence, let me thank you for initiating this incredible event. Why should we remember Alfred E. Smith? That, that's a very real question. What lessons does he have for a new century, new millennia even? After my book, Empire Statesman, came out, one of my students, shy but curious, came up and sheepishly asked me a question. I understand you wrote a book about a politician, said he. Uh, yes, I replied. He then stammered, but, but, didn't he lose? <laughs> Why would anybody want to write about someone who lost the presidential election? Why indeed? First of all, Al Smith was a model New Yorker. Like myself, like most of those on the stage or in the audience today, he was of immigrant descent. His father was of German and Irish heritage. But Alfred Sr. died when Al was young, only 11. It was his mother that raised him and formed his consciousness, gave him an identity. His maternal grandmother, Maria Mobilehill, was from Westmeath County near Dublin, 
and his mother Catherine raised him, and that made him an Irish. Al grew up on the streets of Manhattan. Like any New Yorker, it influenced his life and his career. The city was, it was an outgoing lad, a devout Catholic, a regular attendee at St. James Church. It should not surprise us that a youngster like this came to the attention of the local branch of Tammany Hall, next to the church, the most important institution in the neighborhood. First, it was just running errands, but soon more important assignments came. Al began to, to use a phrase he would employ throughout his career. He began taking a contract agreeing to complete a given task, a solemn oath never to be betrayed. Even as a young man, Al was as good as his word. As a great politician, his motto was, let's look at the record. That's still pretty worthwhile. Soon Al's talents as an orator came to the fore, and the ward leaders began asking to give talks. His fame spread in Tammany Hall, which, by the way, was one of the great talent agencies in American history, put him up for the state assembly. Al was an unknown, this was his first race, and he honestly didn't do that well. Running in 1903 against both a Republican and a Socialist in the Simigrant District, Al got 76% of the vote. Come on, this is a Tammany Thruster, what do you expect for crying Al Al? Arriving in Albany, Smith had mixed feelings. On one hand, he'd come a long way from the streets. He was now a lawmaker, a legislator, but he was also the lowest of the low. He was expected to stand when he was told, sit when he was told, vote as he was told. He thought of quitting. He changed his mind and he rose to the occasion. Al Smith decided he would be somebody and he would do it in politics and his life changed as a result of that decision. Al began to read every bill from start to finish. When he didn't understand a term, he looked it up. If the bill was an amendment to existing law, he went to the New York State Code and examined the original legislation, figuring out how and why it was to be altered, an endless process of cross-reference and then cross-cross-reference. No historian, including me, by the way, has ever fully explained why he made this decision, but a couple of things that we do know. First of all, this is the turning point in his life when he changed from being an ordinary Joe to becoming a leader. Second, if anyone asks why Al Smith was a great man, nothing explains it better than this story. Most people, you maybe, me for sure, would have been happy fitting in, being a person of some acclaim, getting the modest rewards of a good job. Not Al Smith. Al Smith wanted more. With his life, for New York, and for America, he rose to the challenge, he accepted the contract. And it paid off. At the New York State Constitutional Convention of 1915, one of the most important assemblages ever as it rewrote the state's fundamental document, Al stood out. George Wickersham, who went on to be Attorney General of the United States, says Al was the most useful man in the convention. Ellie U. Root, one of the great patricians, said of all the men in the convention, Al Smith was the best informed on the business of New York State. Al was finding his identity as a man and as a politician. That identity was one that bore him lasting honor and answers the question my student posed at the beginning of this talk as to why we should remember him. Al Smith was becoming the country's foremost politician speaking up for the new America, for the emerging immigrants in the city, not only in New York, but in Chicago, in Cleveland, Albuquerque, Seattle, San Francisco, everywhere, in other words. And Al, more than any other statesman of this era, was their spokesperson, their champion. One story more than any other details his contributions to our society in ways that impact us all. On March 25th, 1911, the Ash Building was just a typical New York factory. It's still there, by the way. It's an office building on the northeast corner of Green Street in Washington Place, NYU District. On that day, it entered American history. At 4.40 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, fire broke out in a wreck, and no one has ever determined how it started, whether it was from a spark or a cigarette. Smoking was banned, by the way. It doesn't matter. Within seconds, the flimsy fabrics and paper patterns in the shop, the oil, the wooden table, everything was a roaring blaze. Women fought to save their lives, only to discover the horrors of the new industrial order. Yes, there was a fire hose, but it was cracked and rotten, had no water pressure. Yes, there was a staircase. Practicality dictated that its door must open in, instead of towards the outside, thus blocking the entrance as women pushed forward. 
trying to escape the inferno. Yes, there was a back entrance, but it was chained shut to make sure no one would steal a garment or take an authorized, unauthorized break. Yes, there was a fire escape. No code covered its construction, so it gave way as soon as a few frightened bodies crowded into it. No, no one had ever conducted a fire drill because it took time, and time was money. Terror grew as the survivors crowded into the one small elevator car, measuring only five by six feet, the operator making frantic trips to save as many as he could. All the rest were trapped inside the burning factory, and they died. Outrage followed, and the state created the Factory Investigating Commission to look into conditions and create new laws. Robert Wagner, the father of Social Security, later on was chair, Al Smith was the vice chair. They went everywhere, and they saw everything. It reached its nadir when they looked at conditions of women and children in the state canning factory. One reporter for Crude Housekeeping said that every one of these tiny children is sick and tired. Exhaustion taps the puny strength. Fatigue and undernourishment destroy the energy needed for life. I found one woman who worked in the canning factories to get an 80 hour a week job, she actually worked one week 119 and three quarter hours in seven day week. That's the equivalent of doing three 40 hour a week jobs at the same time. When an investigator asked one child how long he had been working at the job of rolling cigarettes, his reply was a masterpiece of modern anonymity. The kid replied, ever since I was. And Al changed America. They passed bill after bill reforming working conditions. Today, when you go into a movie theater where darkness is the premium, there is a sign, a lit up in red marked exit. That's because of the laws Smith and Wagner passed. Al picked a difficult decade for, to run for president. We remember the 20s and the light time for prohibition and bathtub gin for flappers and flippers and glib mayor Jimmy Walker. The reality was much darker. Disillusioned by a tragic war, despite, despite prosperity, Americans turned inward, raising the worst barriers to immigrants ever erected in American history to keep out Jews and Italians and Poles, newcomers from Southern and Eastern Europe. This is the heyday of the second Ku Klux Klan. Most associ Americans associate this hateful organization with the third incarnation during the Civil Rights era. What is not generally known is the 20s Klan was far and away the largest and mightiest. Unlike the other two, which were Southern based, this was uniquely national. Millions of members from coast to coast. The state with the largest Klan membership was not Mississippi or Alabama. It was Midwestern Indiana. Hugh Carey, only the second Roman Catholic governor of New York State, told me he remembered KKK rallies in Hicksville on Long Island when he was growing up. We should also note that their foremost targets were not African Americans who were already being held down by the Jim Crow laws, but the hordes of new immigrants in the cities whose dens, those dens of foreignness and depravity. And Al, huh, Al was everything they feared. Uh, look at this. He was a Roman Catholic. He was Irish. He was an immigrant to sin. He was a reformer. He was a wet on prohibition. He was a New Yorker. And he was a minion of Tammany Hall. John Roach Stratton, a fundamentalist minister who followed, literally followed around Al around on the campaign trail and spoke after him, he said, Al Smith represented, this is a quote. He said, Al Smith represented, quote, Card playing, cocktail drinking, poodle dogs, divorces, novels, stuffy rooms, dancing, evolution, Clarence Darrow, overeating, nude art, prize fighting, actors, greyhound raising, and modernism. <laughs> well, he got the last one right, but poodle dogs! <laughs> but that was the year the Klan drove readers to action by warning this man is going to get the Catholic and the Wed vote, quote, the Jew and the Negro vote. He will get the vote of the Jew Jesuit movie gang who wins sex films and Sunday shows to coin millions through the corruption of youth. He will get the vote of the vice trust, the gamblers, the red light, and the dope ring vote. And despite this roster, why he shines in heaven, Al never bought back down. Running for president in 1928, Al stood up for who he was, for the people he spoke for. He had a simple message. 
Nevertheless, one immensely powerful still today. But these people, the immigrants living in apartment buildings and cities, were Americans too, just as good, no better, but also no worse. And those living on farms and in small towns and those of old stock whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. In the middle of the campaign, Al traveled to Oklahoma. And when he crossed the state line, they burned crosses as train passed. Speaking in Oklahoma City, September 28, 1928, Al addressed a hostile crowd, but also spoke over the radio circuit to America. He stood for his values we should still cherish. He said, bigotry is dangerous for the future life of the republic. And the best way to kill anything un-American is to drag it down to the open, because anything un-American cannot live in the sunlight. His speech was about being a Catholic, but he really was about being an American. We are a great, glorious people, mix of all peoples, more unique in that regard than any place on earth. It is a source of strife sometimes, but it is also a greatest strength. We are a mighty fiber made up of a near infinite weave of thread. His closing was poetry. He said, let me make myself perfectly clear. I do not want any Catholic to vote for me because I'm a Catholic. If any Catholic believes that the welfare, the well-being, the prosperity of the United States is best conserved and best promoted by Mr. Hoover, let him vote for Mr. Hoover. But on the other hand, I have the right to say any citizen of this country that believes I can promote its welfare, that I am capable of steering the ship of state safely through the next four years and votes against me because of my religion, he is not a real, pure, genuine American. Al paid a terrible price that year for standing up for all of us. All along America, signs went up saying, for Hoover and America or for Smith and Rome, which think it over to Americans. A lawyer interviewed two workers in a tanning factory in Mill Middlesboro, Kentucky. The lawyer asked some, most of the men down at the works how they were going to vote. The mass majority favored Hoover, only a few supported Smith. When queried if that meant you men are satisfied with conditions, under the Republicans, they said, no, times are rotten. Well, what was the problem with Smith? They said, well, I say he's a Catholic. Well, what is a Catholic? First man said, damn if I know. <laughs> the American standard said, Rome suggests that Pope may move here. That's right, he's going to move here. In, in North Manchester, Indiana, a Klan lecturer warned his audience what to watch out for. Beware the imminent arrival of the Pope, literally. He may, I'm quoting, he may even be on the train tomorrow. That's right, he may be on the train tomorrow. Um, he may, he may, be warned, prepare. America's for Americans. Search everywhere for hidden enemies, vipers at the heart's blood of our sacred republic. Watch the trains, I'm telling you, do it, watch the trains. <laughs> Photos distributed nationwide showed the construction of the Holland Tunnel, claiming this was the secret passageway being built right now to bring the Pope all the way from Rome to Washington. <laughs> Al tried to say, well, you know, Toronto tunnels cost 25 million a mile, the Vatican's 35 million. <laughs> Every commentator was stumped. The great social worker Lillian Wald wrote a friend about the organized bigotry, the like of which I have never seen. I feel as if some poison gas has spread over us and that our democracy will suffer from this for many years to come. Frances Perkins went on to be the first woman cabinet member when she was campaigning for Ellen in Maryland. That's the oldest Catholic settlement in America. She encountered what she described as, quote, some of the most terrible, fantastic prejudices and dreadful yarns I had ever heard. It had pointed, I had pointed out to me the estate which had been purchased for the Pope, and when the Pope was coming, as soon as Smith was elected, it was pointed out to us, they knew it for a fact. Marvin Jones, a Texas Democrat, went into a drugstore in his hometown of Amarillo and was asked if he was going to vote for Smith. Well, Jones was a good party man, he was a liberal guy to boot. He said, yeah, I'm going to definitely be voting for Smith. The proprietor looked at him and sneered, and I quote, we've been fighting that bunch for 2,000 years. You think I'm going to turn the government over? <clears throat> so why should we remember Al Smith? Because he was a great man. 
and because his life has lessons for her own age. Al Smith can still teach our generation, generations coming up, those beyond important values, and ideas about what this country stands for. When Al Smith died, President Franklin Roosevelt released a statement that spoke of, quote, the qualities of heart and mind and soul, which made him the idol of the multitude. To the populace, he was a hero. Frank, friendly, warm-hearted, honest as the noonday sun, he had the courage of his convictions, even when his espousal of unpopular causes invited the enmity of powerful adversaries. That cost him. Smith's tenure as governor of the great state of New York, he attracted, because of his tenure, he attracted national attention by his skill as an administrator. It was a natural sequence that he should become the candidate of his party for the highest office in the land. In a bitter campaign in which his opponent won, Al Smith made no compromise with honor, honesty, or integrity. In his passing, the country loses a true patriot. In 1960, the man who would finally close the debt, America old Al Smith, stood up in those rich Hyannisport tones proclaimed, the bitter memory of 1928 will fade, and all that will remain will be the figure of Al Smith large against the horizon. Roosevelt and Kennedy's words were all knowable. But you see, Al Smith's appeal was always in part personal. Francis Perkins remembered how, during the gubernatorial campaigns, the behavior of the crowd surprised her. No, no, no matter how much she thought she knew about politics, she wrote, I recognize they're liking him, but they cry. Folks would rush out when Al Smith appeared, run to see him, just cry, tears rolling down the cheeks of many people. They did that for many reasons. But above all, because Al stood up and stood up and told everyone who could hear that honker of a voice that these people, his people, had the right to be called Americans. Thank you very much. Bravo. I told you he knew his stuff. His book, Empire Statesman, uh, it's still available by Amazon, is it not? Yes, Dr. Slayton? Yes, Empire Statesman by Robert Slayton, S L A Y T U N. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate you being here. My Terry Galway, take it away. Hi there. It's, it's wonderful to be in this tremendous space called the Sheen Center with such a distinguished panel and talking about Al Smith because. I've been thinking about Al Smith for a long time. Maybe even longer than Bob has. Maybe as long as Al Smith IV has, I don't know. <laughs> because one of my first memories as a grade school student at Our Lady Help of Christians in Tottenville, Staten Island, where I, st where I started in 1960. And the presentation nuns who taught me talked about Al Smith. The first book I remember reading as a young person was a biography, a children's biography of Al Smith. I, mean, I think I read it because Sister Brendan said I had to. <laughs> but it connected in some way. And of course, by the time I was in grammar school, John Kennedy was president. And as Bob so eloquently just quoted, JFK is sort of saying that America, the debt was now paid, right? A Catholic had been elected president, had been shown to be just as good an American as anybody else. But for a generation of Americans who were maybe slightly older in 1960, I'm not sure that they felt that the debt had been paid because Al Smith was such a remarkable person and such a great hurt had been visited upon him, a hurt that I don't think he ever actually recovered from. And certainly they didn't. And I think there was, even though we had our picture of John Kennedy in the classroom until, of course, his very tragic ending in 1963, there was, I felt, uh, among, in that grammar school, and, and even later on when I went to high school at Monsignor Farrell in Staten Island, there were still older adults who didn't have memories of Al Smith but who had family stories about Al Smith, as Hugh Carey did. And one of those stories is told actually by Peter Quinn, the great novelist and essayist in Commonweal in America. And Peter Quinn, whose, whose father was a New Deal congressman from the Bronx, told a, a, a story that had been passed down to him. Peter's old, but he's not this old. 
um, that in 1928, one of his neighbors, one of his parents' neighbors in Parkchester, on election night, ha flew the American flag outside his house. The day after the election, the flag came down, and the way Peter tells the story, it never went up again. Right? Now, that's, we historians know that we shouldn't trust secondhand stories, but still, I think it's, it's a powerful memory that was passed down. And I felt it as a grammar school student in, on Staten Island in 1962 from those presentation nuns. And I, I, I must give credit to the presentation nuns and the Christian Brothers of Ireland who taught me at Farrell and those lay faculty, all of whom inspired me to not only think about Al Smith, but to think about American history and the way Al Smith changed American history. And that's why I'm here today, because of Our Lady Help of Christians and my senior Farrell High School on Staten Island. And Smith spoke to these people in ways that John Kennedy frankly didn't, because he was one of them. When Smith died, as Bob pointed out, there was, there was great grief in, in Catholic America, in New York, and, and in the mainstream media that recognized what a unique figure Al Smith was. The Times, in its obituary, said that there had never been a story like Al Smith's before. It said, we've had many presidents who've come from rural settings. And it mentions Lincoln, and it mentions Andrew Jackson, and it mentions all those Gilded Age presidents with beards that we use names we don't remember anymore. But it says, never before has a street urchin risen from the sidewalks to national prominence and almost to the highest office in the, in, in the land. And you know what? That story still hasn't been repeated. There's nobody who's run for high office, certainly one high office, quite like Al Smith which is one of the reasons why we honor him today. And think about what he represented, as Bob touched on. He was a New Yorker, and yet his grandmother grew up in County Westmeath, and there were generations of Irish and Jews on the Lower East Side whose grandparents had come from peasant upbringings, from the shtetls of Eastern Europe, from the townlands of Western Ireland who had never been in a city before. And they settle in New York, and within two or even one generation, they become quintessential urbanites. I mean, Al Smith was many things, but he was a city kid, and he loved it. When he went back to Ireland in the 30s, and you would have thought this would have been a sentimental visit, and, and it was, but he wrote in his newspaper column that upon leaving Ireland, he got on his knees and he thanked God that he was an American. He said, you know, basically, I'm fortunate to have been, not that my parents, my grandparents came from Ireland, because look where I've risen, and that was not possible in Ireland. So these children and grandchildren of immigrants become these quintessential American city dwellers, and Al Smith spoke for them. They may not have known him well or that well in Boston or Chicago, but they knew him. He was one of them. And that's how a whole generation of Americans felt about Al Smith. And then Bob also touched on his Catholicism, his personal Catholicism. It was a very simple, devotional Catholicism. But in 1928, or actually in 1927, when he was beginning to run, you know, everyone knew Al Smith was going to run for president again. It was all set up, basically. A guy by the name of Charles Marshall, uh, a lawyer, wrote this essay in the Atlantic Monthly, which basically challenged the idea that a Catholic could, could run the United States, could understand concepts of liberty because of his faith. So this created quite a sensation. Charles Marshall was somebody, every, all sort of literate people who read the Atlantic Monthly, they all knew who he was. And so the question now becomes, is what is Al Smith going to do? Because this is a challenge. This guy is quoting encyclicals and quoting teachings from the Pope and saying, OK, Smith, what do you say to this? And Smith's inclination was to ignore it. And among other people, Franklin Roosevelt, who was advising Smith at the time, said, you have to answer this. And so he turned to one of his close aides, Joseph Proskauer 
who was a judge by the time, and basically said, and I'm not going to try to imitate Al's voice either, but basically said to the judge, you answer this. To which Proskauer said, great, a Protestant lawyer challenges a Catholic politician and a Jewish judge gives the response. <laughs> perfect. And you know what? That's exactly right, it was perfect. Only in New York. But I think Al's Catholicism and his public record are tied, even if he never attempted to tie it together. Because this is the, 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 the politicians, the Catholic politicians who came of age in the early 20th century, not Smith, but others, some of his protégés, talked about Pope Leo XIII's uh, encyclical in 1890, 1891, Rerun Navarro, of new things, which sort of is still uh, you know, a quintessential statement of Catholic social teachings. And one of Smith's protégés, this guy Jeremiah Mahoney, said that we young politicians read this uh, Leo's document and were filled with the desire to make life better, to in essence write a social contract based on Catholic social teaching. So I think that even though Smith didn't necessarily, as he said when he read Marshall's essay, he turns to Proskauer and says, what are all these encyclicals anyway? I never heard of any of them, <laughs> right? But he lived, the, he lived that encyclical in everything he did. He was, as Bob said, a great governor. And, and for those, you know, we're historians, we should give out dates, right? This is the 100th anniversary of, of Smith's election in 1918. He did lose re-election in 1920 in the Republican landslide of, uh, uh, of that year. Uh, when Warren Harding uh, was elected president, but then he, the terms were only two years back then. Uh, he then subsequently won re-election as governor in 1922, 24, and 26, and 28, of course, he runs for president. He was a great governor for many reasons, but as Bob indicated, he was a master of government. He taught himself how government works. They say he never read a book, but he read lots of bills, and he knew where the bodies were buried. And so when he reorganized New York's government, which had 200 or so departments and bureaus, and he consolidated all of those departments and bureaus into about you know, a, a dozen or so cabinet offices. That sort of created the modern office of governor of New York, which served as a model for all other governors with, with a lot of executive power. He argued for a four-year term, which is exactly what we have now. He basically, he and Robert Moses created the state park system, hydropower, public ownership of uh, hydropower, the list of his achievements, uh, I mean, we don't have enough time. He was that good. Al Smith loved what he did. He loved the idea of public service. He respected the public service of those who opposed him. And they respected him too, eventually. They had no choice. He knew more than they did. It didn't matter how many degrees. He knew how government worked. He was a pragmatist, but he also stood for principle at a time when the very principles of democracy and American ideals were at stake, and that was in the 1920s, as Bob has indicated. To me, the, the high point in some ways, even though many historians would say it was a low point, in 1924, the Democratic National Convention was held here in New York at Madison Square Garden, and the largest contingent of people at that convention would have been the Ku Klux Klan if they were their own delegation at the 1924 Democratic Convention, the Klan would have been the largest uh, delegation. And at that convention, where Al Smith was opposed by William Gibbs McAdoo, who was the Klan's favorite candidate, he didn't denounce the Klan, he was not a Klansman himself, but the Klan decided that McAdoo would be the guy who was gonna stop a Catholic from getting the high office of, of nomination to president. The Democratic Party, uh, led by Smith and others, had a plank, a, a sort of a clause in their platform that they wanted included, which would have condemned the Ku Klux Klan by name. No brainer, right? No. And Smith forced that to a vote. Many people, including Franklin Roosevelt, told Smith, look, back off. Maybe we'll get a compromise where the convention, the Democratic Party, will condemn all secret societies. <clears throat> and the Klan had indicated that they would be okay with that. And Smith said, no, no. 
If we stand for anything, we stand against the bigotry of these people, and we will force this vote. And we will force people to go on record in 1924 in the United States of America, in Madison Square Garden, to say yay or nay to the Ku Klux Klan. It failed by one vote. But Al Smith put the party on record, and he put his, he put his opponents on record, and he put his supporters on record that this would never happen again, and it didn't. By, by the time 1928 comes around, Al Smith is nominated on the first ballot. In 1924, the convention in New York, that took 103 ballots over two and a half weeks. Most people think it was a disaster. I see it as the birthplace of a new kind of politics, the kind of politics where, of tolerance, of a word that surely Al Smith would use, multiculturalism, diversity, the party, as Bob said, of the new America, of urbanites, of Jews and Catholics, of people who didn't come over on the Mayflower, people not like Franklin Roosevelt. That party was born in the chaos of that convention, and it was Al Smith who led the way. The other thing that's amazing about Al is that he was not afraid to surround himself with people who, on paper, were smarter than he was. Robert Moses, a controversial figure for sure, no one would deny his brains. You know, Robert Moses um, loved Al Smith. And you know, Smith brought Moses along, and uh, Moses was, was, was eternally grateful to Smith. He's, as Bob points out in his book, you know, uh, Robert Moses worked for a lot of governors, right, through Rockefeller. The only one he called governor was Al Smith. He also uh, made alliances, or made friendships, I should say, with people like Bell Moskowitz, uh, a, a young uh, or middle-aged Jewish woman born of the social reform movement who looked at Al Smith and said, there's somebody who can get things done. Yes, he's a Tammany guy. Yes, he's, you know, an ethnic. Not, not that that matters to Bell Moskowitz, right? But, but there's somebody I can work with because he has the best interests of the people at heart. And so Bell Moskowitz goes from being the sort of high-minded civic reformer to being Al Smith's political brain. When Moskowitz died in 1933, I think, Smith was in tears and said she had the best brain of anyone I ever met. He didn't say the best brain of any woman I ever met. The best brain of anyone I ever met. He brought these people into his orbit. His relationship with Franklin Roosevelt was tortured, uh, and we don't have enough time in calendar year 2018 <laughs> to go into it. Suffice it to say, though, at least in my understanding, Franklin Roosevelt looked at Al Smith and said, you know what? That that's how you get it done. That's how it works. Roosevelt had failed in a bid for the United States Senate in 1914, falling to a Tammany guy. He lost the vice presidency in 1920. Uh, and now, of course, he, by then he had polio. And Al Smith created a space for Franklin Roosevelt to reinvent himself, to reinvigorate himself, to stay in the game. And in 1924, when the, when the decision was, came to Smith and said, who do you want to nominate you for president? His answer was Franklin Roosevelt. And that, of course, is the first comeback in Franklin Roosevelt's career. He appears on stage for the first time since contracting polio and, and truly is of mythic uh, proportions, the courage and bravery that it took for Franklin Roosevelt to do that. And he did it on behalf of Al Smith. In 1924, after Smith was not, uh, lost the nomination for president, he ran for governor again. His opponent was Teddy Roosevelt Jr. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who is now basically Franklin's legs and eyes and ears, Franklin Ro Eleanor Roosevelt campaigned for Al Smith against her own cousin. And in the you, know, you can't tell the story of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, the most famous political couple in, American, in the 20th century American history without talking about Smith and the profound effect that Smith had on their lives. In 1928, when Smith lost the uh, presidency, but her husband, Franklin, became governor, people went to Eleanor and said, well, how do you feel about your husband winning? And Eleanor says, it doesn't matter how Smith lost. The national ticket lost. So that's how dearly Eleanor Roosevelt felt about not only Al, but his wife, Katie. It's really quite touching. 
You know, again, I don't want to go into the, the history uh, after 1932 of, of Frank and Al. Suffice to say that uh, although Smith and Roosevelt had hard times in the 30s, eventually they reconciled because beginning in 1933, Al Smith saw in Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany the same forces of hatred and bigotry that he had seen in Oklahoma. And he told an audience of New York Jews, I recognize the hatred, and I'm not going to allow that to happen here. You know, we're not in this world. And he campaigned against Hitler and the Nazis from 1933 right to his, practically his dying breath, because he's, he had seen bigotry, and he knew what it felt like. And that was what helped reconcile him to Franklin Roosevelt. Ultimately, Al Smith created a space for all of the outsiders in American politics in the early 21st century, that, that new America that Bob writes so eloquently about. He created that space. Now Jews and Catholics could feel fully American because of Al Smith. But here we are 100 years after his election, and I can safely say, as a, a journalist and as a historian, we're here to celebrate not just the first Catholic to be elected governor, not just the first Catholic to be nominated for the presidency. We're here to commemorate a great man and the best governor this state has ever seen. Thanks a lot. By the way, folks, if you do want to hear the rest of the story, the uh, Al Smith and Franklin Roosevelt, that's Terry's new book. And Terry, I think it's available afterwards, right? Yes. Way to go. <laughs> what a coincidence. Folks, i got to show you something. Uh, this is a cigar humidor uh, that belonged to Governor Elspeth. All right? And his great-grandson, our next speaker, is the man who gave it to me. And that's one of the many reasons why I admire Al. And that's one of the many reasons I invited him this evening. And that's one of the many reasons I look forward to You got to the cigar box and I got cancer. <laughs> and that's one of the many reasons I'm eager to hear him speak. Al, you'd be the first to admit that you're no scholar like Dr. Slate or Terry, but you do have a lot of family stories, a lot of recollections, and a lot of the passion of your great-grandfather. So we're thrilled to have you. Welcome, Al. Thank you. I would just uh, reiterate a couple of things that uh, Bob said about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. He was shocked by what he saw. So I think that was a big, big turning point in his life. And they traveled all over the state, all over the country with Bob Wagner. It, uh, it, it just made him the man he eventually turned out to be. I thought the one story about when they were building the beaches out in Long Island, and Al Smith went out to go out there to cut the opening ribbon, and some guy yelled out, you're just going to let the rabble out here. He said, young man, I am the rabble. <laughs> so, uh, you're not here to hear me talk tonight. As I said, these two guys wrote books and I read a book. So, <laughs> reminds me a little bit of the uh, George Bush at the Alsman dinner in 2002. He said, I've seen Bill Buckley's up on a dais. Bill went to Yale, I went to Yale. Bill wrote a book, I read a book. <laughs> Bill started the Conservative Party. Instead of couple parties myself. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you all for coming, and thank you for inviting me in. Al, we thank you. Al, for those of us who know and admire him and Nan, he kind of continues the tradition. Got a lot of enthusiasm and passion, especially for the causes that the L. Smith Foundation, under his leadership for so many years. Are you uh, saying I have a big nose? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you ought to wear a derby, all right? Uh, well done, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, We got another 15 minutes or so, everybody, and I thought I, I might uh, lead in a, a bit of a conversation. Dr. Slayton, real quick, though, what did, ha after he lost in 28, things were not the same, he did think he should be renominated in 32, no. did he not? Yeah, he, he definitely did. He, um, 
He felt it was due him. He lost in such an ugly race. He, he just really did. Um, he thought uh, by 32 the depression was evident. He thought the Democrat was going to win. It was his turn to redeem what America had done to him. Thank you. Terry, you, uh, your book, of course, is on uh, FDR and Al Smith. It, is it tough to escape the fact that FDR didn't treat him with the graciousness that Al may have expected, even after FDR's victory? Didn't he expect a cabinet position? Or You know, th that was never clear. I, I think he might have. Uh, I think part of the expectation, though, was that after Roosevelt, and mind you, you know, Smith picked Roosevelt to run for governor in 28. That's where it all begins, right? I think Al did think that he would sort of serve as a shadow governor because, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was going to Warm Springs six months of the year. You know, he was absent. Uh, but that didn't happen. And, and I think that uh, Smith felt that Roosevelt should have continued to employ Robert Moses as secretary to the governor, and secretary to the governor even to this day is the second highest person in government. I mean, Melissa DeRosa is Governor Cuomo's secretary. She's a very powerful person and the first woman secretary uh, to the governor. Uh, I think he also wanted uh, Roosevelt to continue to employ Bell Moskowitz. And when Roosevelt was thinking about that, Eleanor Roosevelt said to Franklin, you have to decide whether you're going to be the governor of New York or Mrs. Moskowitz is. And, and I think that, I think, having looked at politicians for a very long time, I think Al might have been a little naive to think that Franklin Roosevelt would have kept on his two, right, if you can have two right-hand people, that's who they were. Terry, while well, you got the mic, elaborate a little. This is a fascinating theme of this book, that the relationship between FDR and Al Smith really kind of generated the contemporary Democratic Party. Because what you had in, in uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was kind of the Brie and Chablis crowd, kind of the nose in the air. And what you had in Al Smith was the hot dog and beer crowd. Something you're more familiar Maybe with? Maybe I'm a little more comfortable with that. And the two of them did not get along, all right? But the two of them shrewdly came together. And right. that's fascinating, the way you document that. Don't you think he'd have been a great Secretary of Labor? Yes, he would have been a great Secretary of Labor. Unfortunately, Francis Perkins got that job. Yeah. But, but yes, I, I think uh, Smith had, you know, Robert Caro tells a story uh, in a great film called The Irish in America uh, from uh, 20 years ago. But Smith was still vital in 1928. He was still in the prime of life. And now he's sort of cast aside. And it do, you know, doesn't, get the, doesn't get a cabinet post under FDR. But, but before that, in the 20s, when everybody was still friends, or at least pretending to be friends, uh, the, the, the divide in the Democratic Party had always been between the sort of wine, white wine, to, to use his evidence's imagery, the white wine, progressive, nose in the air crowd, and, and how many pictures of Franklin Roosevelt have you seen with him with his nose in the air, right? I mean, Frances Perkins says that's what was one of his, her enduring images of Franklin Roosevelt, was his nose in the air. And then there were the urban Catholics and Jews, because it was, it was about urban life, it was about ethnicity, it was about religion. And those two sides of the Democratic Party did not speak to each other. Or if they did, they shouted across the divide. By Franklin Roosevelt, I feel, Roosevelt coming over to Smith's side in 1924, that that's where the, the magic happens. And you've got these two individuals representing two different sides of the party coming together and saying, you know what, let's figure out what we have in common rather than what divides us. Uh -huh. Al, none of, um, none of Governor Smith's uh, sons or grandsons or great-grandsons Follow. I mean, this man was such a passionate politician. At least I don't think so. Did any of your? No, uh, nobody. Uh, and what he was kind of a tough act to follow. So they were more or less kind of intimidated yeah. by the uh, by his right. legacy, or what? You don't see another Babe Ruth either, you know. Yeah, and you didn't see any of uh, FDR's children. And his, uh, uh, yeah, children. exactly. Yeah. Actually, Al Smith spoiled his kids. Yeah. And uh, they they had. Uh, didn't really aspire to be much of anything, quite frankly. And he was deeply devoted to Katie, his wife. Extremely. She died yeah. shortly before him, Dr. Yeah. Slayton, and it kind of broke his heart, right? Well, it broke his heart. 
it was really a beautiful marriage, yeah. Both married from St. Patrick's Cathedral, yeah. Um, could I, uh, Terry, let's go back. Would you, how did he conquer, or did he, the whole Tammany Hall stigma that Dr. Slayton spoke about? Tammany Hall stood for everything ugly and corrupt. Al basked in it. He did, and well, I think that Tammany's record uh, in, in New York in the 19-teens and 1920s actually did the work for him because uh, Tammany, quite unexpectedly, although I would argue there is a natural progression, but uh, Smith and Wagner were, were proud Tammany Hall sons. And there they are supporting things like workers' compensation and sort of what, what I call lunch bucket liberalism. How can we make life easier for the victims of, of industrial America? And they did it, and they achieved it. And I, even critics like the New York Times and others it, through the teens and into the 20s are saying, this is a new Tammany Hall. You know? So I think that's how he overcame it. But of course, by the 30s, Tammany Hall is on its way to being finished. And it also goes back to its less than savory roots. Terry, you know? by the way, has written another book called Machine Made, sort of a revisionist history of Tammany Hall. But Dr. Slayton, uh, Al Smith supported Alf Landon against Roosevelt in 36. What happened? He, he, no, he did worse than that. He joined, <laughs> no, he did. He joined something called the Ultra Conservative Liberty League, American Liberty League, founded by the DuPont family, funded by the DuPont family. He gives this horrendous speech in 1936, where he basically calls the New Deal a communist conspiracy. As close as, I mean, I think he actually used the term communist. Um, he's, it is really hard to underestimate how hurt he was by 1920. One of the things I argue in the book is that Al was actually very naive about America. Um, for Al, Al really grew up not just in New York. I mean, for Al, a big trip was going north of City Hall. All right, <laughs> um, that, that's a real New Yorker. Um, and in 28, he's got a campaign in the rest of the country, and they're saying, Al, this is really different when you're gonna to go to places like, you know, Nebraska, and you go, no, Americans are American. I tracked down everything I could in his textbook, what he knew about America. He had gone to the Wild, um, uh, Wild Bill Cody, uh, <laughs> Wild West show, and he thought that was America, very heroic and everything, and his, whole, his notion of America was, Constitution, Declaration of Independence of America, and it gets thrown in his face. His whole fundamental belief in America gets thrown viciously in his face. It, it was, it really is one of the, if not the ugliest campaigns in American history. Mm. Oh. Last comment, but Terry Galway, one of the uh, reviews of your excellent book, Frank and Al, said that what real, what yes, as Dr. Slayton said, the 28 campaign with its vicious anti-Catholicism broke his heart. But it hurt him deeply in 32 when he said, I did all the work, and darn it, the snobs won. <laughs> the snobs won, the snobs got the White House, and the snobs get all the credit. Was that, he felt that way, didn't he? I, I think he did. I think he felt that, that you know, he, Eleanor Roosevelt once said that Al, that there was a reverse sort of snobism here, in a sense that Al looked down on Franklin Roosevelt. Al was a self-taught politician who, who knew a bill, who knew how to get a contract delivered. And Franklin Roosevelt was truly a dilettante who got elected in 1910 because his last name was Roosevelt. Uh, and I think he, he I, I think he was also told by people like Robert Moses and Bell Moskowitz, you know, Franklin can't, couldn't tie your shoes, you know? Uh, and I think he really did feel that way. And I think he felt that as Bob has indicated too, that the country owed him one, the party owed him one, and who gets in the way but the lightweight dilettante from Hyde Park, underestimating, mind you, underestimating the old Franklin Roosevelt's own tenacity, shrewdness, skill, and courage. Yeah. Listen, I think you'd agree that happy days were here again tonight at the Fulton J. Sheen Center with these three illustrious speakers. Thank you. Yeah.
Cliff, Terry Galloway, and Robert Slayton. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to Bill O'Reilly and his superb staff here at the Fulton J. Sheen Center who uh, do such a dazzling job. I'm greatly, uh, I'm very grateful to, uh, to Shannon of our staff at the Cardinal Cook Center. Uh, she and her staff put on this magnificent evening. So, Shannon, thank you for, uh, to you and your staff. Thank you. We'll see you at the Sheen Center again. Happy days are here again.